One of the things that sets Haskell apart from many other programming languages is that we often talk about laws, mathematical laws. But these laws might be a bit mysterious to some people. Like, when, why do we care about these laws? When do we benefit from them? And if we benefit sometimes, does that also mean that sometimes we really should be thinking about these laws? Like, when do we have to make sure that these laws hold? And if so, how might we test those laws or even prove them? That's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to the Haskell Unfolder, a YouTube series where we discuss all things Haskell. As always, this show is live streamed, so we invite you to submit questions or comments in the chat, and we will try to discuss them on screen, uh, show them on screen and to discuss them. Right, so I want to start with a simple example of a setter, a lens. And if you don't know what this is, don't worry too, too much about it. Uh, this is going to be pretty simple. Um, so a setter is going to be uh, something that changes the value of a part of another value. For example, we might have a setter that changes the first part, the first component of a pair. Right? So a setter has two type arguments. The first type argument is the type is the type of the thing that we're changing, it might be a pair. And then the second argument is the thing that we are changing inside this bigger value. And so a setter is just a function. It takes a new value for the small part, and then it updates the big thing. Right, so just to uh, stick with this example of changing the first component of a pair, we might have a setter called first, um, which is a setter that changes something in a pair of an A comma B. And what does it do? It just changes the first component, for, which is of type A. How do we do it? Well, we get the new value for this first component. We get the pair, A comma B, and we're just going to replace that first A with X. Right, so in fact, you don't need the A here. Mm -hmm. um, just as an example, um, suppose that we have something like this. We have a pair containing an int and a bool, uh, and we are just change this pair, right? We update it. And we take this pair as input, and we might say, well, let's set that first argument to two in this pair, and then after that, let's set it to one. Now, if you think about this definition here, then if we replace this a by two, and then immediately after replace it by one, then, you know, that's a bit silly, right? We should just replace it by one straight away. Like replacing it by something only to replace it by something else immediately after should be, we should be able to simplify that, right? So we should be able to say, well, actually this should be the same as, uh, if I just give another definition here, uh, just setting it to one straight away. Yeah. Setting it to two and then to one should be the same as setting it to one. And we can sort of see that in this case, right? We can just, we know what first does. First just replaces the element, um, the first component by the element that we specify. So here we replace it by two and here replace it by one. So we might as well just replace it by one straight away. But things change a little bit if we don't know which setter we're using. So let's see another example here. Um, suppose that we have a setter that changes something in a pair of integers, right? And we don't know if it's going to change the first or second component, or maybe both, right? It's some setter, we don't know what it is. Um, we're gonna take an integer, a pair of integers as input, and we are going to apply the setter. And so it's gonna be, we're gonna do something very similar. We might set it to two, uh, and then set it to one straight after. Right, very similar to what we did here, except now we're not using first, but we're using some setter set. And now it's not so clear anymore, right? If I now have this additional definition here um, that takes, does the same thing, but just sets it to one straight away, then we don't longer know if these two programs are the same. And they maybe they are, maybe they are not. It depends on what set is doing. Now our intuition probably is that they are the same program, right? Setting it to two and then setting it to one after that should be the same as just setting it to one. But nothing in the types is enforcing this and perhaps that's not the case for a particular set implementation. So we might wish to insist that this must be the case, right? That this our that we might want to sort of encode our intuition that these two programs should indeed be the same. And we can do that by means of a law. What we can say is that for any setter set, if we set something to x after setting it to x prime, that should just be the same as 
um, as just setting it to X. And, and for equality, I'm just using this triple equality sign well here. I just mean like, and we talk about equality in this case, what I want you to think about is that when X is equal to Y, that anywhere in your program, you should be able to replace X by Y. All right, so if somewhere in your program, you see something of this shape where we set it to X prime and then immediately set it to X after that, that should just be the same as setting it to X in the first place. So now if we have this law, then I now know that these two programs are in fact the same because I can use the law to reason, right? The law says that this must be the same and therefore my program must be the same. But of course, stating the law doesn't make it magically hold, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So the law gives me a benefit, right? I can use the law to reason about my program, but like Andrew says, it doesn't magically hold, right? So now that means I also have an obligation. Every time that I define a setter, I have to make sure that the law in fact holds. So here I define a setter called first. And when we first wrote it, we didn't think about laws, right? But now we have added this law as part of the abstract, like our contract, right? So now we should verify that the law holds for first. But we could property test it, right? So we might say something like this. We might write a quick check property um, that says that the law holds for first. Arguments here, oops. And we can just test this, right? So we have an X and X prime and some pair, and we can just say that if we set it to X and then to X prime in this pair, well, that should be the same as just setting it to X. Uh, did I misspell something somewhere? Oh, sorry, uh, there is an equals. Yeah. Right, yes. And so this is how we might test this law. and. For many things, for many applications, that might be sufficient, right? You've tested it, you've stated the law, you thought about it, you've tested the law. You know, this this is already very solid. Um, but in this case, we can even do better. We can prove the law, and it's not really that difficult. Now, if you have never seen this kind of stuff before, then this might be a bit um, scary. But I want to show you that actually that's not that difficult. So, what we have to show is that. This thing must be the same as this thing here, right? So let's look at these two sides first, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have first x, first x prime, a comma b. Well, um, we can apply the definition of first here, right? We know we can just look at the definition and we just apply it, right? So we know this must be equal to what, right? And here I'm going to replace the definition. Well, I just apply it's x prime comma b, right? That's what the definition of first says. Now I can just do this one more step, right? Now I apply the definition of first here. And so I get this might be the same as x comma b. So this is on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I'm starting with first x a comma b. And now I just have to apply my law, my definition of first once, I know it's x comma b, and now I can clearly see the left hand side and the right hand side are definitely equal. And so we've proven that the law holds. And so mathematicians of the, like the right QED, quality of the this is what we had to show. Um, right. Um, so that's a, first, a simple first example. Let's look at some slightly more interesting examples now. Will it always be that easy? <laughs> uh, well, so mathematicians spend their entire <laughs> lives. Doing no, 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 no. But so. I mean, in the concrete case of setters, I mean, is there, like, I mean, what is a like, what, what is an example? Just as an intuition, what is an example of a setter that wouldn't satisfy the law? So this is two separate questions, right? Is it always this easy? And what's an example? What's a counterexample? And I think probably for setters, it tends to be this easy, right? Because a setter is typically a very simple thing, right? It just replaces a value somewhere in a larger construct. And so I, probably these proofs are typically very simple. Um, mm. If you have a setter that does more than that, right? That doesn't just change the value somewhere, but messes with other things, then, um, then this might not be true. For example, um, 
Uh, here I have wanted a setter for a pair of integers that changed it, right? So maybe mm -hmm. here's a bad setter of this shape. Now what this bad setter is going to do is it's going to take the new value, right? Just like before and a pair. And it's going to replace this first component by this new value that you give it. But it's also going to increment the second component by one. Yeah. Right now, I have an example which does not hold satisfy the law. Because if mm. I call this setter twice, mm. then the second component of my pair will be incremented by two. And if I compare, if I call it only once, the second component of my pair will be incremented by one. Right. So that would not be the same. Now, this, is, this particular set is bad for many reasons, but it does break the law that we're discussing here. Right. Yeah, no, I think, I think indeed, I mean, and, and I think I also agree with your answer to the other question. I mean, sort of like, I, I think as long as setters really structurally replace a part of, of some bigger type, I think it is usually relatively easy to prove. But there are valid setters that are different. Like you can imagine, like if you have an integer and you're, um, having a setter that effectively sets a particular bit of that integer, um, then because it sort of interferes with the internal representation, proving correctness of such a setter might be a little bit more involved, right? Yeah, but, um, yeah, 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 fair enough. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, let's move on from setters now and let's look at monoids. So, monoids is a class that um, is commonly used in Haskell. I'll just uh, recall the definition here. Uh, I'll simplify it slightly from what it is in base. Uh, in base, it's split into semi-group and monoid. I'm not going to do that here. But in a monoid, we have some element, uh, which is sometimes called the uh, unit element or identity, and a way to concatenate elements. Right, so these are two operations. And the intuition that you might have is that, for example, in the example of lists, right, then empty might be the empty list. And this uh, concatenation operator might be list concatenation, right? Um, now, I haven't written any laws so far. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to modify, justify why we might care about laws here. Suppose that somewhere in your program, you have a definition which looks something like this. Um, where we have some foo, which is a bunch of complicated expressions, which all of which are concatenated together with using this, um, this concat operation from the monoid. Now, maybe this is uh, big and complicated. And maybe at some point you realize that actually, hold on, this expression here is useful in its own right. So maybe you refactor and you make a new abstraction, which corresponds to this first thing here. And then you redefine foo to be this new abstraction combined with complicated three. And now my question to you is, is this refactoring okay or not? Did I change the semantics of my program? And this is a bit hard to see perhaps, but this operator is normally right associative. Right? So if I insert brackets here, this is really this, right? These two things are the same thing. Whereas this is really, if you think about it, this, right? Where I have bracketed it differently. In this case, I'm doing these two operations first, and then finally I'm doing this one. In this case, I'm Remove doing the this. three and the final one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In this example, I'm doing this operation first, mm -hmm. and then finally I mean mm -hmm. this part, right? So these are not the same. Now, again, your intuition might say, well, they should be, I mean, maybe they're not technically the same, but they should behave the same, right? Um, and indeed, that's one of the laws that the monarch class tells us. One of the laws says, and this is called associativity, x cons or append y append z should be the same as um, equivalent to x append y uh, append, oops, Z. Right? And if this law holds, then these two programs are indeed the same. Yeah. 
And uh, and uh, I mean, really, the the documentation of monoid, if you look at it in in the Haskell libraries, they uh, like it says that this is the class of monoids. Instances should satisfy the following, and then it lists a whole bunch of laws of which this one is one. Yeah, yeah exactly. So this is part of the the contract, right? Mm -hmm. So if you use mm -hmm. a monoid, then this law you can depend on this law. And conversely, if you define an instance of monoid, you should think about this and make sure that the laws hold. Right, so this law is called associativity, and yeah, Anders already mentioned there are more laws. So the other laws talk about what is this memory thing here. Um, so there are two rules for a memory, and you might even be able to guess them if you haven't seen them, right? But if I if I have concatenation and an empty element, then the question is you know, a question that you might answer, ask is, what happens if I concatenate the empty element, right? And so the law says that that should be doing nothing, right? So if I have x concat mempty, that should be the same as x. And similarly, mempty concat x should also be the same as x. Right. Um, so, um, let's see an example. Suppose that we define list to be a monoid, right? This is what I said before already. So mempty would correspond to the empty list, and this concat operation would correspond to list concatenation, right? But like we said, if I add a law, then if I use this thing, I can depend on the law, I benefit from it. But if I define an instance of it, I have to prove or show that the law holds, right? And so I might write a quick check property. Um, that does this. So let's focus on um, uh, on this case here, right? The first law here. And so I might take a list, and I just test it. All right. So I should say that access counts the empty list, or empty here should be the same as access. Now proving this law. So you were going to say something? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Proving this law is a bit more tricky because we have a function in here which is recursive um, and so you know this is there's no way that I can show you uh, completely how to do such a proof but I want to show you that it's not that difficult uh, give you a bit of an intuition for it um, and the key insight here is that when a function is recursive typically the law so the proof over this function will be inductive or inductive right inductive is just basically the proof equivalent of recursion so let's see how that works um, first, let's recall what this plus plus even is, right? So we have, um, if the first list is empty, then the result is just wise. And if the first list is not empty, then um, the result is going to start with x. And then the re recursion happens, right? We recurse and we just add, concatenate the rest. The first observation, by the way, if we look at this first definition, that tells us what we need to know for this law here, right? If we can just read off the second law immediately, like it's just straight from the definition here. Hmm. Empty list yeah. plus y is equals y. So that one is trivial to prove. I mean, you don't yeah. need induction yeah. or anything in this case. Right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So let's, let's think about the other case here. So let's mm -hmm. prove now that, um, right, we want to prove that x is, MMT uh, is the same uh, as axis. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to do this by induction, just like we define our function by recursion. And just like in recursion, we have a base case and a recursive case, typically, and we have the same thing here too. Our base case is the empty case. Yeah, but perhaps let me add, I mean, the, the, the form of induction for those who have never seen this is determined by the data type we're uh, right. doing induction over. So here we're doing induction over lists and mm -hmm. lists have two constructors. One is the empty list and the other is cons and cons takes another list as an argument. So that's why we'll have two cases in this inductive proof. One, the base case, which is corresponding to the empty list and one, which is sort of the induction step, which is corresponding to Cons, but I mean, if you if you have induction over other data types that have five or six constructors, you'll have induction proofs that have five or six different cases, right? 
Yeah, 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 exactly. And so, but this is true for functions too, right? If I have a data type mm. with multiple constructors, then I typically have cases for each constructor. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so the, they are um, very. Function definitions naturally follow sort of the shape of the underlying data types they operate over. And in very many cases, there, there is an exact correspondence. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. So here we're doing induction over axis, which is a list, and therefore we have two cases. Uh, so the first case is where axis is the empty list. Um, so what we do we have to prove? Well, we just let's have the definition, right? So we have um, we have to prove something about uh, we have to prove this, right? Something about this. This is what we're mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. put something off. Mm -hmm. um, we can just unfold the definitions here. So that's this, right? I've just unfolded mm -hmm. the definition of this and this. And now we can apply um, the rule here, right? The definition of plus plus. And we just say, okay, it's equal to the right hand side, which in this case happens to be empty list. So we get this guy. And we have to show that that should be equal to axis, but axis is the empty list, so we're done. Right? Mm -hmm. so this was easy. Now, in the induction case, we have that axis is equal to some x con some x prime. Right, so now, again, let's plug in the definitions. We have x con x prime, let me, um, uh, let me just un like, apply the definitions again. At this point, the second definition of our function applies. So I can uh, apply it. And it's x cons x is prime plus plus empty list. And now we have this expression here of the same shape that we started with, and we can apply the induction hypothesis, right? Just like in the function definition, we you would use a recursion here. Here we apply induction, and so we can say, well, by Induction, this thing here is the same as axis prime here. And that's exactly what we needed to prove this to be equal to. Right? We, we're back at where we started. So this is concludes the induction proof. Um, now I'm aware that if you have never done this before, this might look a bit intimidating, but the key takeaway here is that actually it's not that difficult. And in many cases, this structure, if you know how to write the recursive function, you probably also know how to write the recursive proof, the inductive proof. OK. And it's really nice that we can do these kind of things in Haskell, right? Because these expressions are all self-contained, and their meaning is only determined by the expression. There are no side effects and so on. So I mean, so that's why these equivalences really hold. Yeah, that's why we love Haskell, right? We, that, because we can do this kind of stuff mm -hmm. in a different yeah. language. This kind of mathematical reasoning is just not possible. Yeah. OK. Um, I, we're uh, coming up to time. If, if, um, well, we have one more example left, I guess. I want to show you an example of where what happens if the laws don't quite hold. Uh, and to do that, let's have a simple embedded programming language. And in this programming language, the program is either done, right? It finishes doing anything at all. Um, it can print a number, or we can sequence programs, right? So sequence first runs this program here, and then runs this program. So we could write an interpreter for this programming language, and the interpreter is just going to say what are what's the output of, of a program, right? So the empty program has no output at all. The program that prints a number just has that number as its output, and the program that Sequences, well, we first run P, and then uh, we run Q. OK, so now we might say, OK, well, actually, you know what? This kind of looks like a monite, right? right? Uh, because we have something that looks like a memty, which is done. And we have something that looks like concat, which is sequence. So the types match, right? The types line up. So that's, that's a good start. But the question is, do the laws satisfy? Are the laws satisfied, right? Do the laws hold? Is this a proper monoid? And actually, the answer is no. The laws do not hold. And they hold, like, they fail almost immediately, right? So, for example, if we take P, concat mempty, this should be equal to P, right? That's what the laws say. But 
if I just unfold definitions here, well, this is sequence and this guy here is done. Um, so that's this, right? And P is very clearly not the same as seek P done. These are two different expressions. So the loss fail. But then the question is, okay, does that mean that this is a bad instance of monoid? And the answer is, well, maybe not. And what we typically say here is that the law does not hold, but the law holds up to interpretation, right? Yes, they are different programs, but they have the same behavior. And so we could state this as a test. We can test this. We can say, um, that this identity, uh, actually it's right, F, um, for a property, for a program hold. So, so what is the property that we're testing here? And normally we would say that P uh, concat mem P should be equal to P, right? And we're saying actually that's not true here. What we can say instead as well, actually, nope, that's not, maybe not necessarily the case, but if we run P, that should be the same as running P cont mem T. Um, so it's a slightly weaker property, but it's still a very useful one. And actually this one is not too difficult to prove either, but I think um, I might skip. Yeah, oh, I think it's, it's, I think it's fine to skip, right? Because yeah, it right. amounts to the same again, in a way. I mean, you're, you're mapping through run, you're mapping it back to the old law, which you've already proved effectively, right? Yeah, yeah. If you try to do it, maybe it's a useful exercise for you to do. And it will also be in the repo that uh, goes with the mm -hmm. unfolder, link in the description. Um, but if you try to do it, you will see actually it's not that difficult. There's no uh, recursion necessary or induction. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but yeah. Now, one thing that I do want to point out about this is that if we have a setup like this, then let's consider this question again. Like when do we benefit and when do we have an application, right? Um, in this case, we benefit less because we have a weaker property, right? We don't have the monoid property holds for every program. We only hold it for up to interpretation. That means that if I have other interpretations, right? Something else that other than run, right? Maybe show, for example, right? My monoid law might not hold. Um, so I can depend on this monoid laws less. Um, however, if program lives in some module, right, and this module does not export the constructors of prog, right, done, print, and sequence are internal to this module, then we know that the only interpretations, the only functions over prog can be inside this module, right? It gives us a, a boundary, like a separation boundary. And then if, as an implementer of this module, I prove the monoid laws up to every interpretation that I have inside this module, then on the outside again, I can benefit from these laws again because I know that every interpretation that I have satisfies the laws. Of course, as an implementer, I have more work, right? Every time that I add a new interpretation, I have, again, another proof application to show that the law holds. Um, yeah, and I think, I think there is quite a bit of design space here as well and different scenarios require different things. I just wanted to perhaps also connect to um, I mean, there are representations that you can choose that actually like satisfy these laws, even if you want to do something like this. Like if you've ever seen sort of like how a free monad is implemented, then that has a, uh, a particular uh, internal representation that basically makes the monad laws uh, satisfied by construction. But then you pay a certain price in that the operations, like that the bind operation in the case of monad may, may actually be rather inefficient to execute because it does certain rearrangement in order to restore associativity. So depending on your use cases, sometimes you may want to do something like this in this prog case where everything is O of one, but um, but your your equalities uh, only hold up to uh, interpretation, and at other times you might want to choose a representation that sort of ensures that the laws actually really fully hold. Yeah, actually, maybe we should do in a separate episode on on representation for this because that's actually quite an mm. interesting topic in its own right. Yeah. Um, all right, if there are any no further questions, then I guess we should um, finish it here. I. 
I don't know what it, what the simple gen is. Is it quick? I mean, we we might. You you think we should do it? All right. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it if it's like one or two minutes, and we can. I think. I mean, there are no questions at the moment. All right. Uh, then let me try to uh, show sh show the highlights of it. So this is another example mm -hmm. of um, where laws don't quite hold. And so most of you will be familiar with the monad class, right? Um, and, bind, um, and we have one of the, the monad laws has, and there are three monad laws. I just want to show one here. It says that if we return x and then apply f, that should be the same of just applying f to x. Um, now, an example of a monad that many people are much familiar with is a generator, like, for example, in QuickTake itself, right? And a generator, I've simplified slightly here, is something that takes a random number generator and produces a value from it. Um, how, now, how do we define this to be a monad? Well, for the return, we just ignore the random number generator. And for bind, we take the random number generator, split it in two, and then call x with the first half of the random, random number generator and f the second half of the random number generator. Yeah. Now, if we now look at the law here, um, then we see that the law fails. So we have to prove something about this, right? Mm. Um, we can apply unfold the definition of return. So this is just a function that ignores the random number generator. Then we unfold the definition of bind. So what does bind do? Well, it splits the random number generator and then applies it, right? And then if we simplify slightly here, what we see at the end is that this is almost the same as just f applied to x, except that we are no longer applying it to the same random number generator that we started with. Instead, we've split the random number generator and now use a different half of it. Right. So the laws don't strictly hold. Um, now, and again, we can have uh, a slightly weaker property that has to hold up to interpretation. And the interpretation in this case, it's typically a probability distribution. And in the repo, I show exactly how this is done. But you can think of a probability distribution as basically a map that says for every input to the function, what is the probability that it generates that input, uh, which we can compute. And then just like before with programs where we said, well, yes, the law does not hold. But if we run the program P, that should be the same as running program P cons empty. Here, we would have a similar property that says, if we compute the probability distribution for some generator, then that should be the same as when we apply the law, right? So it's it's true up to interpretation. In this case, the interpretation is the probability distribution. Yes, these are different functions, technically speaking, but they result in the same probability distribution. So yeah, this is a common example. A uh, quick check, um, of course, is used by everybody. Uh, and so in quick check, you will find a comment that says, this is not really a monad. But morally speaking, it is a monad because the resulting probability distributions are the same, right? So yeah, that's what this is about. OK. Um, if you are interested in the details uh, in the repo, I've worked out all these examples and some more um, with some property tests that you can actually run. So you can play with that. Link will be in the description. And I'll, yeah, um, that will be available after this episode. Um, okay. So yeah. OK, so yeah, thank you for watching this episode of the Haskell Unfolder. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And feel free to leave any comments or additional questions you might have after watching this episode below. Um, and yeah, we'll be back in uh, slightly more than usual, I think, in roughly three weeks of time. Okay.